Michaela, look at everything you've done. Like, this is the least scary thing Mm -hmm. um, that you've done. So uh, we went to do it, and it was off. I think it was part me being scared. Um, part I slipped out of her arms. Um, I was about halfway in the air doing the flip, and I saw the ground, and I was like, I'm not making it around. Like, I know I'm about to hit this ground. Um, so I hit the ground on my throat. This, um, my throat and my whole body, like, did a scorpion over my neck, and I could feel it, and I hit the ground, and as crazy as this sounds, like, I've said this before, but I knew instantly, like, I was paralyzed. Like, All right. This episode of 30 Challenge Podcast is with the beautiful Michaela Noble. Thank you. When I first met you, we were at the Carry the Load event. Yes. Um, I thought you were so much older than you are. Really? Yeah, because um, just the energy that you bring, the how confident you are. Um, when I first met you, I was like, I don't know who this person is, but I know that she's special and that she'll help a lot of people. So, um, Thank you so much. Yeah, how old are you? I'm 18. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's nuts. Um, I'm only 23, and I get that, like, you're only 23 all the time. I'm sure mm-hmm. you get that. You're only 18 all the time. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, I think trauma um, can definitely age a person, and you – you are forced to learn lessons um, at a much, much earlier age. But Absolutely. thank you so much, Michaela, for coming on today. I'm super excited for this conversation. Thank you. I'm super excited. Um, so curious kind of to set the tone for the conversation before we get into, you know, everything that's happened, just your incredible story. I want to know what vulnerability means to you. Just the first thing that you think of when you think of vulnerability. Ooh, I've been thinking about this. I think vulnerability is something I used to be so afraid of, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's something that I've realized just through everything I've been through and talking to so many amazing people, something that makes us all human and connects us no matter where we've been or what we've been through. It's something that we all try and suppress, but it's, it's all in us. Yeah, absolutely. And you've been vulnerable kind of you know, this platform that you've been able to create, mm-hmm. right? Um, which has been awesome to to see. But I know even before all that, um, you still dealt with depression, anxiety, which you're open about. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't love it because I don't love anyone who goes through it. But it's interesting that because when people look at your story, they probably think, you know, everything was amazing before this accident, but mm-hmm. probably not the case. Can you kind of tell me, when you started to experience anxiety and depression? I think it started when I was around 12. Um, I was a competitive cheerleader, grew up doing that and made it to the top highest level that there is um, at age 12. So I was competing and was on a team with 18, 19, 20 year olds. um, So what is the the top Like, what is the top level of cheerleading? What does that look like? Yeah, so there's six levels. Okay. um, And I was at the sixth level at such a young age, you know, I was a child. Um, And that top level is the highest you can get. There's nothing higher. Um, But there's an age limit. um, And you can only get there when you're 12. So I had to wait until I was 12 to get there. Um, but I'm competing with college age cheerleaders as well. So a lot of the college cheerleaders, um, do college cheer and compete on those levels, which that's like technically one level higher, but you can't get there until you go to college. Um, but they would drive into my gym and there's some other top gyms, um, in the U S that people would fly or drive to seriously for, practices um to come and compete on this level because this competitive level is different than the college cheer because when you think of cheerleading you know you think of cheering on the football team or basketball team um but this is a whole different world of its own yeah right is it like the uh is it like the shows with like the crazy cheer moms is it is, is that thankfully is that i mean it kind of okay. is which <laughs> is ridiculous 
Um, I don't know if you've seen the show Cheer on Netflix. Can't say that I have. No, that's okay. But <laughs> if you've seen if you've seen that show, uh, those are like my teammates. Like I was oh, really? just uh, one of the main girls' um, wedding two weeks ago. Oh, really? Yeah. That's crazy. So I'm in the background of that show, which is crazy. It's yeah. me like before my accident and everything. But um, if you watch that show, that's kind of the level that we were at, which is so cool. Right. So you're 12 years old competing with these 18 and 19-year-olds. So mm-hmm. um, when did your mental heart – when did you start to notice your mental health? Was that through like the pressure of all that – of all the – you know, the high level of competition or how did that play out? I think so. I think, again, social media is such a big thing now. Um, And when you get to that level and being on the team that I was on, you have a lot of eyes on you immediately. Um, And being like the flyer, which is the girl in the air being thrown and tossed around, um, all eyes are on you. Mm -hmm. And Cheerleading is a little bit different than other sports. Um, You go out there and you have one shot. Um, Everyone's eyes are on you and you have to be perfect. You are expected to be perfect or there are consequences, you know, Mm -hmm. that you don't get a few tries at it, Um, which is something that was so addicting about the sport is because of the high pressure. You get so much adrenaline and it's like, okay, I got one shot. Like, I got to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, the downside of it is, If you mess up, all 38 other teammates around you are looking at you and blaming you for failing. Mm. Um, And again, I think being one of the youngest on the team with so many older people, it's easy to blame, you know, the younger ones and the less mature. Thankfully, I have always been around older people, always been mentally mature and always told I'm older than I actually am. Um, so I thrived off of being around the older kids. It inspired me and encouraged me to be stronger and be perfect in a sense, not only for myself, but for my teammates and all the fans watching and everything. Mm -hmm. Did you feel, do you feel like the addiction of perfection, do you think that that was only in the sport or do you think that like translated to other areas of your life as well? Definitely transitioned, Mm. translated, um, I think it's something that we all deal with, you know, perfection. And again, having such a following since I was so young, it's been so weird. So what did that, so did you, because obviously like you've got a lot of followers and like have a social media presence. So that started before Mm -hmm. your your accent, okay. Yeah. So so what did that, what did that look like? I think again, by the age of 12, I had like 25,000 followers, Mm -hmm. which is so cool. You know, it's so cool. Um, being in middle school and yeah, you're probably you're probably the girl going going yeah. <laughs> to school and all those things. It was weird. It was it was really cool. Um, it just it changed me, you know, in a lot of different ways. I had a lot of pressure on me because I wanted to be perfect on social media and in my sport and at school and everything. But it takes a toll on you mentally. Yeah. So it's what did exhausting. that exhausting? What did it look like mentally for you? I knew that I couldn't mess up. Again, in my sport, you can't mess up. I think even just going to practices, I would be so anxious before practice. I My stomach would be like, this is like, yeah, TMI, but like I would constantly be having problems with my stomach mm-hmm. and everything and like feeling like I was going to throw up because I was so anxious for every single practice because I had to go in there and be perfect for – not only myself, but my teammates and my coaches and everyone supporting. So I don't know. I feel like I always put so much pressure on myself, but it wasn't as easy as just like, hey, like, don't take it that serious. It's just a sport. You're just a kid because it's the level that I was at. I couldn't enjoy it and just be a kid because I was expected so highly. Yeah, of course. Well, and I think with anxiety, people are just like, just don't worry about it. It's like, well, it's not as easy as I don't want to worry about it. Like, yeah. I don't want to be anxious. It's a, but I know, I know that feeling. Um, yeah, just, I mean, I don't know what it, I'm sure day in, day out, that had to be exhausting to always be thinking about the next practice and thinking about, you know, being perfect and, and what if I mess up? And I think so many people, that's, um, that anxiety drives their life for, for a long time. So about 12 years old, you're competing at this incredibly high level. 
this happened, you know, until, um, was there ever a point where you became less anxious and you like began to like get used to the pressure? Or was it like pretty constant while you were competing at this high level of cheer? It was pretty constant. Um, I mean, I got used to it. It was just the way I lived. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was definitely weird because then I go to school the next day and I'm around just a bunch of kids being stupid teenagers, you know? Right. Um, and then people would be like, Hey, just like chill out, like have fun, you know, like stop worrying so much, stop being an adult already. And it's like, I'm in two different worlds and I can't, I can't not be an adult because I'm expected to be an adult. And mm -hmm. again, like with the social media, it's like, I can't, I can't be crazy and do these things because I'm already being looked up to by people and I don't want to fail them and I don't want to fail myself or my future self mainly, you know? So I, I'm so thankful for the way I grew up, but it's just so different than my peers that it, I wasn't able to connect with them in I, yeah, the way. I have know? that conversation all the time because, you know, obviously the things that I'm talking about and the things that I'm immersed in, right? Like it's so much different than the route I thought I was going to take, which was like, hey, go sell technology and make a bunch of money and, you know, do this, do that. Um, but God has a plan and all these horrible things that happen to us, right, are, are mm -hmm. for a greater purpose. And for you, it sounds like, you know, we'll get into your accent here shortly, but it seems like the anxiety was almost, and the pressure was almost good for you in a lot of ways. But obviously with anxiety and with pressure, there's also, um, uh, there's a darkness to it as well. So mm -hmm. did you experience um, the depression side of mental health before the accident? And how did anxiety kind of play into that? Definitely. Um, depression is something, again, I've dealt with since 12, 13. Um, and it got bad pretty quick. I did online school um, my eighth grade year because of just everything going on. Um, and my mom and I are super, super close. Like she's my best friend. And my depression was getting so bad that I knew I had to reach out um, and ask for help because I couldn't hurt my mom or my family or my friends, you know? Um, so I remember I... How old were you at this point? 13, 14, probably. Okay. Um, I went into her room and I just like laid in bed with her and just like cried. And it was one of those things. It's like, you're just hurting so bad. Like I couldn't even get the words out. Yep. And I was scared because I was like, I don't want her to think it's her fault. Like she's not doing enough for anything. It's just like, I'm struggling. So... I laid in bed and just cried with her and she just held me and I just told her I was like I like I just I, I want to die you know and I cannot even fathom what that felt like as a mother you know and I didn't even want to tell her because I felt so guilty for feeling that way you know um but I had to tell her because it was getting really really bad you know so I told my mom and we talked about it and cried a bunch and she kind of opened up with me that she struggles with that as well, and so does my grandmother. Mm. And it made me feel better that it wasn't like I was crazy, you know. I had something wrong with me that other people were feeling this way too, and it's okay, but you're not going to let that win, you know. Yeah, oh my gosh, yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think because I've had those same conversations with my mother and mental health is on both sides of my family is, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's something that I don't, necessarily know how it works or um but you know it can be passed down through through generations mm -hmm. and yeah i remember being in the same boat like i mean because obviously my my brother took his life mm -hmm. and i was dealing with the same thoughts and I, I just was like my mom's um my mother's picture is the background of my phone because anytime those thoughts come up i would look at him like, okay like it's not an option right it's because not, yeah. because you have you can't put that, you can't put her through this, right? And you can't, um, you know, you can't put other people through this as, it, you know, as well. Um, but yeah, it's like having those conversations and feeling, feeling that guilt, right? But it's, yeah, it's just crazy the way that your mind works, especially when you're dealing with those, with those thoughts. And that's such a hard thing to, to verbalize. Um, but 
the people who you're ta- you're talking to, like your mother, like my mother, they've been in the exact same spots where we were. Mm-hmm. So they know how, they know the language, right? They know how you feel, um, which is um, in a sense, you know, doesn't, not much helps in that moment, but it makes it feel a little bit better that like you said, that, that you're not crazy. Yeah. Cause again, there's such a difference between feeling sad in a moment and depression. Yeah. And I think that was something that I, again, I felt like I was the only one that felt like depressed, you know? Um, but it's such a hard thing to, it feels just so, I don't know. It just takes over your whole body, you yeah, know? No, it's and like, again, we still deal with it today, but being able to talk to people about it and realizing I'm not crazy right. um, has made all the difference. Yeah. No, it's, it's, I don't wish it upon anyone. Cause it's like, Mm-mm. like I was just in my, cause I moved to Dallas and was like, battling this gnarly depression and like sometimes battling just looks like being curled up in your bed like like and I think that for me was really hard to to process but I like remember going into my apartment and into my room and just being like I hate this place like this place sucks and I just had this thought this weekend I was like my apartment's nice and clean it smells good and like everything's organized I'm like I love this place but then just like thinking back to when I was in that moment and just like almost like I like cringe at like the thought of like I can't believe I was in that headspace you know um because everything when with depression everything is looked through this lens of darkness and depression everything right and it's so hard to to get out of it and you know the f- there's literally no worse feeling than I want to die like you can't get much lower than that yeah um so yeah no I I 100% feel you and um it's I talk about this a lot now but it's interesting because like once you go through it, then you have the language and you are more empathetic towards people going through it. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm, um, like I said, not, not glad that we're having this discussion, but yeah, it's, uh, makes for a a more vulnerable, vulnerable conversation. Mm -hmm. I talked to, um, one of my siblings about, again, the feeling of, I want to die. It's the worst feeling ever, you know? Um, and it, kind of blows my mind because she I was like so (laughs) my sister my mom and I were talking and we were like so you've really never had the thought like you'd rather die than like deal with whatever's going on and again it's not you being sensitive it's not you being weak it's like that's the feeling in your body it just feels like the best the best solution option um and she's like no like I've never felt that and it just it's crazy to me that some people just have never felt that and especially with anxiety um again I know a lot of people that struggle with anxiety and I had never really experienced anything like that so when I would see someone having like an anxiety attack I'd be like why can't they just like breathe and calm down you know it's just but as I've started to kind of feel those emotions and things it's like oh like you can't just breathe. Like breathing is you're breathing, but right. It's not just as simple as just taking a deep breath and just breathing. So it's kind of opened my mind that like if you're not dealing with something, it's hard to understand it. Mm-hmm. Um and I've seen like a lot of teenagers struggle with that. Like they're dealing with depression, but their parents are like, You're just you're being again, like laying in your bed. You're just being so lazy. Like Maybe if you'd actually go and like do something and like go work out or like get a job, then you wouldn't be so depressed. And it's not like that. No, it's at not. All. Yeah. And I used to think the same. Like, obviously, I've always been very empathetic, but I used to be like, just ask for help. Right. And like, um, that's always been the mission just ask for help. But asking for help is just the first step. And it is a very hard step to take, but there's nothing harder than going through a battle with with your mental health because Absolutely. it impacts like like everything your brain is telling you to do and everything that your body is like not allowing you to do you have to force yourself to do the complete opposite thing of what your mind's telling you to do oh just brushing your teeth yeah exactly washing your face sometimes that's too big of a struggle and as gross as that is like sometimes that's too big of a struggle to do right yeah in a day yeah exactly and so i mean it's just it's just small steps you have to take and you know i think for for suicide um, th- those thoughts, your brain is always trying to find a solution to problems, right? That's how our brains are, are wired. Mm-hmm. So when you're dealing with anxiety and your brain is compromised, right, and, and depression, that thought of it would just be easier or I would rather die than deal with this problem head on, that's your 
that's your brain's response to whatever you know um, is going on chemically and whatever whatever's going on in your in your life. And for for normal brain, that would those thoughts would never for a healthy brain those thoughts would never come in, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when you're depressed and anxious, they do, and that's a terrifying thought. And then for me, it was like my anxiety became worse because I was I was like why am I having these thoughts that I want to die? And I was like, and then that thought scared me and created more anxiety. And then, so this loop keeps on coming out. And then now you have, you're continuing to have the same thoughts of, of, of suicide, right? And um, suicidal ideation. And I mean, it's, it's terrifying. And it just goes to show that fear is the driver of anxiety, right? Because when I, now that I understand, it's like, hey, you can be afraid to take your life. That's a justifiable thing to be afraid of. Right. But once you understand that it's just fear and that you're never, ever going to do that, then it allows you to, you know, confront it head on. Wow. That was good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but so you already had dealt with a lot of things before going into um, or experiencing your accident. So why don't you tell us about um, your your alive day? OK. September 20th, 2021. So almost two years, getting close to two years. Um, I was in the backyard with a group of teenagers, um, and football players and cheerleaders, school cheer, um, which is something I just did for fun with my friends, mm -hmm. you know, to be a kid. Um, and we were practicing for pep rally for the homecoming pep rally. And we were teaching the football players how to do a flip. And it was super easy. Like, we were teaching the boys how to do it. Um, I'm sure you've seen it before. Literally where you put someone's foot in your hands, and then you hold onto their shoulders, and they lift, and you just do a backflip. Right. Um, and so one of the girls was like, here, Michaela, like, come here. Like, we're going to show the boys how to do it. And I had never actually done this before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've done insane things. I've had, you know, grown men throw me in the air, and I do – a flip and then a twist before I land back in their arms. You know, right. I'm not um, afraid of being in the air and doing flips and tricks and trying things. I love it. I thrive in that. Um, and so she was like, come here, like, let's just try it. We'll do it real quick. And I was a little nervous because I was like, what if, you know, what if something happens and I fall in front of 15 teenage boys? Like, that would be embarrassing, you know? Right. Um, but I was like, okay, like, it's fine. <laughs> like, okay, look at everything you've done. Like, this is the least scary thing, mm -hmm. um, that you've done. So, uh, we went to do it and it was off. I think it was part me being scared. Um, part, I slipped out of her arms. Um, I was about halfway in the air doing the flip and I saw the ground and I was like, I'm not making it around. Like, I know I'm about to hit this ground. Mm -hmm. Um, so I hit the ground on my throat, this, um, my throat and my whole body, like did a scorpion over my neck and I could feel it. And I hit the ground and as crazy as this sounds, like I've said this before, but I knew instantly, like I was paralyzed. Like I just, I just knew and I didn't scream. I didn't cry. I didn't yell. I literally just like hit the ground and had my neck turned and just laid there. And I was faced away from everybody. So I was faced this way. Everybody was on this side of me. And it was quiet because everybody was like, holy shit, like that just happened. Like everyone knew it was bad instantly. You saw my body. Um, and I think the fact that I didn't say anything also kind of showed. Um, again, all athletes, all around kids who've gotten injured, broken bones, you know, fractures, anything, concussions. It's not scary. Um, but that was something that really scared a lot of the guys and the girls talking to after, you know. Um, as crazy as it was, someone went inside and grabbed the mom, and the mom happened to be a nurse. Um, so she came outside and laid with me um, and just, you know, had small talk, just keeping me um, awake and alert. And How much pain were you in at this Oh can't probably just put it in I it felt I knew I thought I broke my neck and my back um because 
my back was on fire. It was September. It was hot outside. I was laying, but it really felt like my back was on fire, like burning. Um, and then my neck and my shoulders just were in extreme amount of pain. Um, but I was just, I was scared, but at peace at the same time, if that makes sense. I, I didn't cry at all. I just, I knew it was a serious, serious situation. And I knew I was paralyzed and my life was changed forever in that moment. Um, but again, I was an athlete. I knew the worst thing I could do was freak out and try and move because I was only going to make the situation worse. I knew I needed to breathe and just stay calm, not only for myself, but all my friends, because all my friends were scared too, you know, and I was of course scared, but I wanted to be that's wild calm that you were, for them, you know, that's wild that you were that calm mm -hmm. after that happened. I feel like yeah. if it was me. I would. Oh my gosh, I can't even. Know. Oh, I would say I would say that I would scream and cry, you know, but in the in the moment that just wasn't how my body went. Yeah. Um a lot of people I've talked to that have had the same level of injury that I've had um and gone through the same amount of pain, say they don't even remember the day, they don't remember the moment, they lost consciousness. Um but not me. Yeah, I remember every single second, and it it really does feel like it's yesterday. You know, I've listened to a lot of your podcasts and listened to a lot of people who have been through traumatic events, and I feel like it's one way or the another. Yeah, right. You either remember every single feeling and second and moment of it, or you don't remember it at all. But I remember it. Hmm. So, do you like? Do you, as you describe this? moment is this like is this like traumatic for you like do you think that you are deal with like any f sort of like ptsd from the moment because i mean you sound very calm mm -hmm. when you're talking about it like are there yeah i guess do you are there any moments where it's like looking back at it that you deal with ptsd or any of that i don't think so yeah. i think something like that something that helped is because i talked about it so much in the beginning mm -hmm. And I thought about it so much in the hospital in the days. And I shared all my emotions and feelings with everyone around me and on social media. I think that was something that helped me. I started dealing with it and healing in the beginning and not suppressing yeah. it down. Yep. You know, and acting like I was fine and okay because I was anything but fine and okay. Um, and I think, again, I trusted my family and my friends, and I was so open about my mental health struggles before any of this came along that gave me the open door to share what I was dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. So you're in the hospital. Obviously, your entire life has completely changed. Mm -hmm. um, what, and, you know, I think you present and your brand is so much positivity and strength and bubbliness, which I love. Yeah. But obviously there's some dark times after mm -hmm. the accident. So Absolutely. what did that what did that darkness look like and how is it different than the depression and anxiety you experienced beforehand? Because I'm sure they were vastly um, different headspaces. Absolutely. I think as crazy as this sounds, and I told my mom and my friends and my family this. I loved my life after my accident way more than I did before. I was struggling so intensely before my accident, months and weeks before my accident, that I felt like life was easier being in the hospital, laying there, not able to move anything but my head and being in a neck brace and chest brace like I couldn't even move my head but I loved my life so much more after which right. is just crazy to even fathom crazy but I think it was because my physical struggles you could see you could see I was broken and I was hurting and I was struggling but it just it showed what I was dealing with inside do you know what I mean yeah what I that gives me chills because so Jake Schick, um, I don't know if you know you know Jake, he, yeah, with ATL or with a one tribe, but you know he talks about he's 
like you pretty much gone through the worst physical injuries and pain that one can go through. Mm -hmm. And he says, by far, the the internal and the mental battles are hurt so much more, Absolutely. right? Because when you when you go through physical pain, you don't want to die, right? Because you know it's you're gonna work through it. Mm -hmm. When you work th when it's internal and you're dealing with mental battles, you never know when it's gonna end. And you just want it to end so badly because this is something you have to live with every second of your life. And it just goes to show, your example goes to show that, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but you would rather deal with becoming paralyzed. Oh, absolutely. Than dealing with the internal battles. And like, just think about that. Like for people listening, think about that. When you, when you, when someone talks about their mental health and going through depression and anxiety and suicidal ideation, they, because I've been there too, right? Where I would rather experience anything physical than what you have to deal with mm -hmm. internally. I think mental health is something that, again, is so easy to downplay because you can't see it. Um, but unless you're experiencing it, you do not realize how serious it is. Um, I struggled. I really haven't talked about this a bunch. Um, it's something I've kind of been afraid to talk about and kind of been holding off, but I struggled with my body image so much, again, rooting back in cheerleading mm -hmm. and being in the public eye um, and being in very little clothing, you know, and being judged for – my muscles and my body and how I looked and how I weighed and how I felt in the air. Um, I got to the point right before my accident, it was probably four or five weeks before I told my mom, I was like, I, if I do not quit cheerleading, like I'm going to kill myself. Mm. And I did not mean that in a dramatic way whatsoever that's how I truly felt because I was starting to become a woman. You know, I was 16 years old. I wasn't this little 12 year old girl body anymore, but I was still on the team with girls that were smaller than me. Um, and it was the worst feeling ever being like, oh, Michaela, like she's heavy, you know? And I was not overweight whatsoever. <laughs> Definitely I not. was yeah, very I muscularly you. built. I was built like an athlete, you know, um, and love to work out and love to power lift and all those things. But it just took such a toll on my brain that when I, this is something that like totally broke my mom's heart. But when I had my accident and was laying in my bed, like I was just smiling and so happy. And I remember this again, like it was yesterday. I told my mom, I am so thankful that I'm paralyzed because I never have to worry about my body ever again. You know, I my body's never going to get judged to anybody beside me anymore. I would much rather have this body that I'm in than what I had before, um, which is crazy because I look back now on pictures and videos of myself and I was like, I was beautiful. You know, my body was beautiful and it still is beautiful. It looks so different now, but it's just crazy how my mind saw my body. Mm. Versus how I can see it now. Yeah. Um, something that I struggle with too, which I've never opened up. I never really thought to open up about it. But I'm sure as your vulnerability will help a lot of girls out there. I'm sure a lot of dudes go through it too. But um, yeah, something that I've struggled with for a long time. I guess I was a um, – Lucas knows. He's known me since middle school. But uh, I was a little – like a little chubbier. And I think that, um, you know, I always had a difficult time with my body – and then as I started, you know, getting, uh, I guess like, yeah, into, into lifting and stuff and, um, nutrition and all that stuff, like, um, body dysmorphia stays with you throughout it all. So no, no matter how someone else views your body, you look at it a completely different way. Mm -hmm. And I look at back, like at pictures of myself, like when I would, I would work out in the morning and then not eat until four and I would box again without eating anything during the day. And like, Sure, I looked like shredded, but like looking back at it now, I was like, dude, you look like malnourished. Like, um, but it's just like these are the type of these are the type of tricks that your mind plays on you. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that's crazy. I, I want to get a little bit further into that. So how did that play out? Like, were you um 
limiting like food that you would take or like how how did the how did your body image kind of play into um the the decisions you were making yeah i think it's crazy first off that your mind can like totally just hyper focus on one thing and everything going around you like doesn't really matter like i i think it started back when covid kind of happened okay so i was cheering working out lifting practicing almost every day of the week you know except fridays mm-hmm. um and so i didn't go through puberty until covid happened um because i was working out and i was so slim that my body just couldn't handle it mm. um so then when that all that stopped and covid happened I got my period and um, started becoming, you know, a woman, um, which is nothing to be ashamed of Mm -hmm. because it happens, it's life, you know. Um, But I didn't know how to deal with it because I was like, I'm not 95 pounds anymore. I need to be, I need to lose weight, you know. Mm -hmm. And being 100 pounds, anything over 100 pounds just sounded disgusting to me, which is wild no 16 year old should be I mean you you should be a healthy weight you know but I was like I'm never going to be over 100 pounds in my life because the society and the groups that I was in body dysmorphia and eating disorders was the norm you know I was gonna say I was gonna say nothing I don't want to put anybody down but again that's just like the society that I was in well I think it's important for girls out there to hear who are you know, in not only cheer, but, you know, um, I'm sure it's big in like pageants and all oh, these, sure. yeah, all these, you know, like where you're, um, you know, where your body image and how you look is so important, right? And, and how you perform. Like, I can't imagine the, how much pressure that puts on your, on your mental health. Mm-hmm. Even just on social media, I, I personally don't struggle with it or haven't really, um, but I know girls just, destroy themselves just seeing other girls that they're like gosh I would do anything to have their body you know and I think it's not even just girls it's not just teenage girls it's men Mm -hmm. um and people of all different ages we the grass just is always greener on the other side you know right we always feel like we could be bigger or skinnier or more muscular you know it just it's crazy how that can just take over your whole life. Mm -hmm. And so I think probably from COVID to my accident, that was all my brain was thinking about. Um, But I felt like I didn't really have an escape because cheer was just a major part of who I was, who Michaela Noble was, you know? Um, And I was at the highest level, so I just – had to stay at that level till I went to college. And then I was going to be a college cheerleader. So then I knew I had to deal with that struggle four more years ahead. Um, And then I didn't know what I was going to do after that. But I just knew that I was in this situation and there was, it felt like there was no escape because this is my path I had out in front of me. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of had to deal with it. But it got so bad that I ended up quitting. Um, a few months before my accident happened. Oh, really? No, nobody really knows that. Um, yeah, I ended up quitting competitive cheer. Um, and I'm very thankful that my mom let me because, again, I went to her and I told her, like, I would rather die than keep living the way that I'm living and the, hear the things that my brain are telling me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just I felt stuck and, like, there was no escape. And I had to go in and have that tough conversation with my coaches who – have basically been like my parents as well, you know, seeing me grow up so much. Um, and thankfully they understood and they they just wanted what was best for me. Because again, no sport or no situation is worth what I was dealing with. Um, and so I did that. And um, just... The summer before my accident was such a weird time, Brant. It, like, I knew something was going to happen. I thought someone in my family was going to die. I thought 
I knew something big was going to happen. Mm. Um, I talked to God about it and I looked through my journals and I I had a journal entry that I was like, I know something bad is going to happen soon and I'm just scared for what it is. Like, God, please give me the strength to be able to endure whatever is about to happen, That's, which is yeah, just gives me goosebumps. You know, it's like, how did I know? But I just knew something was going to happen and mm -hmm. I was scared. Yeah. Well, I think so many things that you just said, I think <clears throat> one, you know, going to your mom and going to people who cared about you. And like, that's why being vulnerable and asking for help is so important because you think that people are going to be disappointed or that you can't reach out for help or that, you know, you're gonna let everyone down. The people in your life just want what's best for you, mm -hmm. right? So if you go and say, hey, I would rather die than cheerleading, no one's gonna be like, well, looks like you should die then. Like, no, they're gonna say, hey, screw cheerleading. Like, we love Michaela and we want Michaela to stay here. So no job, no relationship, no sport is ever worth prioritizing over your mental health, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's a very important point that you made. And also, um, you know, I will, so my mom talks about this, but she knew she was not surprised when Matt took his life because God had prepared her to deal with it. Really? Right. So, um, and she, and she knew that she didn't know what was going on, but looking back at it with the amount of trauma that Matt had experienced to his head and, um, just trauma in his, you know, looking back at the trauma that he experienced in his life, like my God prepared my mom for, for Matt dying. Wow. Um, when when I was going through my mental health battle, which was very recent, by the way, like like very recent, um, I was like terrified that of like the thoughts that I was having. And my mom was like, God prepared me for Matt leaving. He has not prepared me for you leaving. I know you're gonna be okay. And I like believing, like hearing that, I was like, I, I don't believe you. Like, I don't know how I'm gonna be okay. Um, but she knew that. So it's just, it's crazy that God prepares us for these trials and he's always with us through suffering. Um, but I'm sure your prayers the summer before your accident were, God, I don't know how I'm going to keep doing this. I don't know how I'm going to keep cheering. Um, I can't live like this, right? And, uh, you know, you'd hate to think that God answered your prayer with um, paralyzing you. Yeah. But, you know very well could have been answers to prayers. And I think that that's such a, um, sometimes God answers, a lot of the times God answers our prayers in ways that we do not expect, right? And I think like me, for me going through my anxiety and depression, my prayer before that was, um, and moving to Dallas, was like God turn me into the person who you want me to become. Because I deal with imposter syndrome and the people that I talk to and the conversations that I'm having, like I deal with imposter syndrome a lot. And I'm like, God, like turn me into the person, the man that you want me to be. Um, and I, I don't think that that's a destination that you're ever going to achieve the person who you want to become. I think mm -hmm. that, that that's always changing. Um, but I had to go through the darkness in order to become closer to who God intended me to be. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear your, you know, your thoughts on kind of God's answer to, you know, maybe the prayers that you were, you were giving him. Yeah. I mean, I, got saved that summer. I was baptized two months before my accident happened. And my that summer is so special. I just got so much closer to God and realized it was more of a relationship, you know, not mm -hmm. a religion. Um, I'd grown up Christian, um, but never got baptized because, I don't know, I just, I wanted it to be my decision and I wanted to truly knew what it, know what it meant, mm -hmm. um, not just like get baptized to like check it off the list. Mm -hmm. um, and my parents were like, yeah, like, okay, that's okay. Um, which I think is so cool. And again, I look back and I'm so thankful for that. So I got baptized, um, I think it was in August and then my accident happened in September. Mm -hmm. um, and between that month, I just 
gosh, I, it was summer. I got to focus just truly on getting into the word and talking to God. And I have just the most amazing and godly friends um, and community that just showed me the joy and the love of God um, and what he could do for me. So when my accident happened, I I wasn't necessarily scared. I was at peace, like I said, which is wild. But um, my mom got there and I got in the ambulance and everything. I was so calm. I the firefighters still make fun of me and talk about it anytime I see them because I was making fun of them. Like in the ambulance, they had masks on and one of the guy took his mask off to do something and he had like a mustache and I was like, oh, like you look <laughs> so not good with yeah, the mustache. Don't touch me, bro. Yeah. I was yeah. like, <laughs> gross. I was like, you need to shave that. <laughs> and they were That's like, insane. what? You don't think it's good and I was like no you look so much better if you shaved it and like it's just like a joke but I don't know I just had such a sense of peace and calmness um so it's like God's got me um and in the ICU as well I was in the ICU for four weeks and my lungs collapsed twice um and I had pneumonia I had to get a trach was able to eat for two, three weeks, mm -hmm. couldn't even have water, you know, um, just had everything stripped away from me. Right. And it was the most beautiful thing to me now um, because I just spent so much time with God. And I think, I don't remember the exact prayer, but I was like, you know, it's the thing where it's like, God, I surrender to you. Like mm -hmm. whatever you have for my life, I want it. I don't. I'm done trying to mm -hmm. fulfill what I have for my life. I just want your will for my life. And it's like, God, I give you my all. And again, you know, you say that, but you kind of don't mean it literally like paralyze me and take away my whole body and lay me in a hospital bed for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. It's not what I intended or wanted at all, but I'm so thankful for that experience. Just the conversations I had with God were so deep and meaningful. I, I remember them to this day, you know, and a lot of people say they like have seen God or heard him. I have not, um, but I felt the peace of mm -hmm. him in my hospital room. And, you know, there's nothing scarier than being in the ICU and not knowing if I was going to, I could have died, you know, there's nothing. I mean, the thing worse than the ICU is, death you know so right i was i was scared but i was so joyful mm -hmm. and happy in the icu which is so not common right. um we were probably <laughs> i was uh, a little different than the rest of the people in the icu but it was it was it's god you know and mm -hmm. i love him so much and i surrendered all to him and i whatever he has for my life, like, that's what I want. So it's just, it's crazy. Um, and with the social media that I had, I created a social media page. So back when the ambulance, when I was in the ambulance, I was like, mom, take my picture. <laughs> like, take my picture. This yeah. is like, I'm in an ambulance. This is cool. And again, I knew they were doing the things. They were like, can you feel this? Can you feel this? Touching my toes, taking my shoes off. I knew the severity of it, but I had peace and I was like, mom, take my picture. Like, right. I know I'm going to want this later. And she was like, no, I'm okay. Like, I'm, this is serious. I'm not taking your picture. <laughs> and I'm like, please so take wild. my picture. Um, but I was like, I knew I wanted to document it from the beginning. Um, so I, my mom created a Facebook page, which originally started just for friends and family, obviously, um, just to update them because she didn't have the energy or time to text every person individually. Right. Um, so she created the Facebook page and posted daily updates. Um, again, she, my mom hates social media. Like she hates it, but I love it. And yeah. I love sharing what's going on with me. Um, so I made her and my sister take pictures and videos of me and kind of post updates for everybody. Um, again, it started out as friends and family, but people in the community 
started joining the Facebook page and then people in the cheer community and then school and it just grew right. drastically, um, like instantly. Mm. I remember I woke up um, a few days later in the ICU and my sister, at this point, nothing had happened so I could still talk and eat and everything and my sister was like, okay, well, guess what? <laughs> and I was like, what? And she was like, you have 60,000 followers on Instagram. And I was like, shut up. That's crazy. I was so excited. Yeah, I was like, yeah. oh my gosh, this is so cool. And I was like, why? Yeah. And she was like, Michaela, like your story, like people are following along. Like they're along for this journey with you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. Like that was just the beginning. But I was like, well. Um, so I did updates every single day all through the ICU, all through rehab, all through coming home in that journey and just truly sharing all my struggles. And I think one of the biggest takeaways that I take away from um, it is my physical struggles, sharing that with people um, and sharing my mental struggles just really gave people the opportunity to share their struggles and mm -hmm. relate. And again, mine is physical and you can see it, um, but we all struggle and we're all dealing with stuff that is so hard, mm -hmm. you know, um, but mine's physical and you can see it. Um, that's just one of my things. So I've been back at school. I went back to school last year and did my senior year. Um, and it was crazy. I I was I'm a very bubbly and you know mm -hmm. outgoing person, um, and going back to school was obviously scary. Being in a wheelchair and everything, again, everyone in my community kind of knew what was going on, right. and it wasn't a surprise when I came back to school. Um, but it was crazy how even kids I wasn't that close with would come to me and talk to me about things they were struggling with. Um, because I had already kind of put out my hand, like, right. and shown my vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was really cool. It was really cool. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, that's probably the most rewarding part is like being able to walk people through their struggles, right? Mm -hmm. um, and people having people trusting you to share their darkest their darkest points right there's nothing more rewarding in that and yeah, yeah. you know as I listen to your story it's like God was you had already been through so much right like with your battle with depression and anxiety right and then um, you know I'm sure the obviously it was not an easy thing where you've had to learn and how your life has changed but like mm -hmm. god prepared you right through the through the the mental balance the mental battles that you had already been through and it sounds to me like you are so just tired from the internal battles that like when you were in the hospital it was like the first time you could breathe in a while and the first time we're like exactly yeah the first time we're like your mind wasn't playing tricks on you right and you weren't having to battle your mind which is the most exhausting thing in the world yeah I was so happy and again that's so sad you know and heartbreaking um but it was okay Michaela you're gonna focus on recovery you're gonna focus on yourself prioritize yourself um because again I'm someone that I want to help everyone around me mm -hmm. I want to fix not fix people but you know fix their problems and help them and I was in a situation where it was, I had no choice but to focus on myself and what I was struggling with physically and mentally so that I could get to a point where I could, again, help others. Um, but it was it was me. I had to focus on me in that point. Right. Um, you know, you talk about your recovery and focusing on yourself. Um, I know you know, the Adaptive Training Foundation, mm -hmm. you went through their program. Um, how how was that experience and how did that have an impact on, on your recovery and your life? Uh, ATF has been just heaven sent, I would say. Um, 
again, I think it's such a God thing that out of anywhere in the world or in the U.S., it's 25 minutes from where I live. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's just such a blessing. But going to the gym, again, um, I felt the imposter syndrome that you were talking about um, because I was like, I just had an accident and broke my neck. Like, my I just, I, I was only, I, just, par- I was only paralyzed. So. I just broke my neck. Like <laughs> anyone could do it if they really wanted to, you know. But, right, yeah. um, I, I felt guilty because I was like, I am not a hero. I am not a warrior. I didn't go off and serve for our country. I, you know, I, I'm nothing like these people, you know. Um, but being in a class with, I was the youngest in my class. I was 17. Um, and then the oldest guy in my class was 65, I mm-hmm. think. And he joined the military when he was my age mm-hmm. and was in it until he um, retired. And I was like, what in the world am I going to talk to this guy about and relate? Because him and I have nothing in common, you know, and mm-hmm. all these police officers and men and women that worked in the military, I mean, they're heroes. And I I just look up to them so much, you know, and I'm so thankful for them. But I just felt, you know, like a privileged little white girl that had an accident and was now grouped with these amazing people. I didn't feel worthy um, of the resources and support that I was getting because I was like, there are so many people out there that deserve it a million times more than I do, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, But being in the class and working out with these people, it was amazing. Our class was so tight knit um, and created such like a family. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, I was like, what am I gonna talk to this man about? We have nothing in common, you know, Um, but it was crazy. Again, opening up and being vulnerable and sharing what I was struggling with mentally um, and obviously physically, which you could see, we were able to relate and just strip away everything and realize at the end of the day, you and I are human. If I'm vulnerable with you and you're vulnerable with me, like we have a lot in common, Mm -hmm. you know, and we struggle. And what's going on between my ears is what's going on between your ears too. And our situations are completely different, but my struggles and my pain is just as valid as yours is. Right. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's crazy. The set up, again, I go back to the the darkness that I just experienced, and I'm mm-hmm. so thankful for it because now I can relate to so many different people, right? And I can people, someone's on their bed and they can't get up and they're crippled with anxiety, right? And they don't want to do anything. They don't want to go brush their teeth. They don't want to shower, right? I've been there, right? And until you're there, it's like you just hear about it, right? Mm-hmm. But you can um, you can feel, you know, you can, you can really feel the pain that someone's going through. So for when you said that, I know exactly where that was leading with this, this guy who was 65 and you're like, you know, feeling that imposter syndrome. What you know, how do I know anything this guy's going through? I bet you guys were so much, were so very much on the same page, yeah. right? Um, and that's the beautiful thing about suffering is that, I mean, God calls us to suffer in the Bible, but he also says that he'll be with us through all of it, right? But the beautiful thing about suffering is that, you know, no matter what it looks like, right? You sitting across from me in a wheelchair and the suffering that you've been through and me um, losing my brother, like it's just a part of life, right? And mm-hmm. Um, you have to lean on other people and be vulnerable and ask for help and share your experiences because that's how you suffer well, right? Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, as you've built this, or I want to know, you know, what's your, what is your proudest moment at the Adaptive Training Foundation? Ooh, that's a good question. Actually, it was... Crawling across the ground, um, 30 yards, dragging my dead weight of body um, across the gym. It, crazy enough that you said that, it was actually a year ago yesterday. Oh, really? And I still have the scars on my elbows from crawling across the gym. And gosh, I was bleeding. They had to get rid of all the mats, everything. But 
Um, it was something that David Rubora was like, Mac, let's do this. And mm. the longest I'd ever done was three mats, like, you know, just little workout mats. Um, and that took everything out of me, you know. Um, but he was like, let's just do it, you know. And so I was like, okay, David's the type of guy that I just love and adore so much. And he makes you – he gets you to do things that you don't think you can do. Mm-hmm. Um, pushes you outside your comfort zone and absolutely love that again being an athlete and you tell me I can't do something okay that's exactly what I need like I want to do it you know Mm -hmm. and prove you wrong and prove me and my brain wrong you know Um, so I crawled across the ground um, with my biceps being partially paralyzed my triceps fully being paralyzed you know no hand function my fingers are paralyzed Um, And it took me over 20 minutes to do that. And 20 minutes doesn't sound like a long time, but dragging my body across that ground. um, (laughs) Sounds like a really long time. It was actually terrible. Yeah, I'm sure. 20 minutes of any, yeah, that I'm sure just everything that you're, all the strength in your body for 20 minutes, that sounds brutal. Yeah. Um, And again, during that time, um, I had a lot going on in my mind, you know. I was thinking about people in the military, you know? I was like, Michaela, you can't stop. You know, everything in in you wants to stop when something's difficult physically. You want to stop um, and quit, um, even mentally as well. But I was like, you can't quit. Like, you can't, you can't give up. You know, you got to keep going and doing this. Um, and at Adaptive Training Foundation, we all have, um, like, our phrases, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and mine is God's not done with me yet, which is kind of transition into like my life saying it's like, God's not done with you. Um, I have it tattooed on my arm. Mm -hmm. God's not done. Um, simplified because he's not, um, that was something I said back in the hospital to my sister. One of the first times I saw her, I was like, I'm alive. You know, God's not done with me. He has woken me up today. Um, Because my mission on this earth is yet to be finished, you know. Mm -hmm. He still has a plan for me and he has me here for a reason. I'm on this podcast for a reason sitting across from you. So, um, you know, I just, I crawled and crawled and crawled and crawled. um, And I was like, I can't quit because God's not done with me, you know. Um, And just crawling across the gym was brutal, but it was so much more than just crawling across the gym, you know, on the ground. Um, it was such an accomplishment for me, um, something, again, one of those things that the doctors told me I'll never be able to do, X, Y, and Z, and it's like, well, you don't know me, and you don't know my God, you know, so Mm. I, I love to prove people wrong and just dig deep and grind because God's not done with me. I love that so So much. That's something that keeps me going every single day, and what is there a particular Bible verse that that you lean on um, that kind of helps you through dark times or um, yeah yeah um, Proverbs twenty twenty four I believe uh, the Lord directs our steps so why try to understand everything along the way mm-hmm. you know I say that so quick but the Lord is directing my steps He knows the reason I don't have to know the reason you know. Mm-hmm why I try and understand everything along the way. There's so many things that happen and you're like, God, why? Like, why did why did this happen? Mm-hmm. Um, but then you reflect back on it weeks, months, years later, and you're like, ah, right. like now I see. I needed to go through that. He was leading me for what was going to happen in the future. You know, everything with cheer and everything I struggled with mentally. He was mentally and physically preparing me for my situation that happened. So... I just, I mean, I wouldn't be here without my relationship with the Lord, you know? I wouldn't. I Mm -hmm. think my mind would have taken the best of me. Um, So I'm very thankful for that and for my people around me. Um, It means everything to me, you know? Yeah. And how much richer and more meaningful of a life you have now, right? Where you get to help people going through the 
hardest of times and people look at your story as as hope right and the most important thing um and what i ultimately want the 38 challenge to do is you know bring people closer to christ right and i think mm -hmm. that that's um that's got to be the mission right because you know you can save someone's life on earth but if you can't save them forever what's the point yeah um what's what's one piece of advice that you would give to someone she would, you know two two parts to this question okay. first part what's one piece of advice that you would give to um the younger michaela to a girl right now who is you know struggling with her body right who is dealing with this perfectionism right who's whose mind is um at at war with her and she would rather die than continue to put on this perfect little face what advice would you give to that person hmm. i would say it's easy to look at people on social media or even me in my situation and say look what they're going through like i could never go through that my situation that i'm dealing with is so less significant mm -hmm. you know because it's internal um but your struggles and what you're dealing with is just as important as anybody. And your feelings are valid. You know, you're not being dramatic. You're not being a emotional teenage girl. You know, you are struggling and you're hurting. And you need to reach out to the people you trust and love and tell them how you're feeling inside because nothing's going to change and it's not going to get better unless you let people help you. Mm -hmm. I love that. And then what is your piece of advice to um, someone who has just gone through a, you know, a life altering experience event? What would be your advice to that person? I think about this a lot. I would say this is the time that you focus on you. You know, in life, we don't want to be selfish and just focus about our focus on ourselves and think about ourselves because this world is so much bigger than us. Um, but I would say this is the time to fully focus on you, and you need to not look at the future because the future is terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, it still scares the crap out of me. A year and a half, almost two years out of my accident, the future scares me. You know, I think it scares everyone. It's yeah terrifying um focus on yourself and i know everybody says take it day by day but seriously take it day by day and struggling with anything mentally one day into the future is too much to handle you know mm -hmm. um so focus on today think about what you can do in this moment to better yourself mentally or physically um and just let all your barriers down and let people love on you and help you. Mm -hmm. Last question for you. What does the 38 challenge mean to you? Ooh, the 38 challenge to me shows me and has taught me that, again, vulnerability is beautiful and it's hard and your story and what you're dealing with is significant no matter who you are what age you are gender sex identity whatever you know what you believe in you are human at the end of the day and you struggle just like you and I and community and vulnerability is just the most beautiful thing and things aren't going to get better until you open up mm. so I think if you're 60 years old or you're 12 years old don't be scared to ask for help um and talk to someone that you trust and love because again at the end of the day it could mean the difference between life or death mm -hmm. seriously yeah absolutely well i love it that might have been my favorite conversation and i appreciate you Stop. so much for for being on thank you um looking forward to what God has in store for your future, and um, He certainly is not is not done with you. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much for coming on, Michaela. Thank you.